Hello, everyone, and welcome to our office hours today. We're uh, very excited to uh, uh, to have uh, Professor Xiaoli Meng uh, back with us. Um, I had interviewed him for our podcast series uh, a few months back, and we got wonderful feedback. Uh, it's always, um, it's, it's, I have to say, it was one of my favorite uh, uh, interviewers, uh, interviewees, I should say. Uh, uh, so uh, to just to do a very, very brief introduction, um, uh, Professor Meng uh, is a professor of statistics and uh, founding editor of Harvard Data Science Review. Um, he's a very humble man. However, he was named the best statistician under the age of 40 by the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies. Uh, he received his uh, BS in math from uh, Fudan University in 1982 and his PhD in statistics from Harvard in 1990. Uh, he was on the faculty of the University of Chicago before returning to Harvard, where he served uh, as a chair of the Department of Statistics and the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences from 2012 to 2017. So welcome back, uh, Professor Meng. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you very much and thank you for having me again. The one thing Philip forgot to mention is, is I was the best statistician at 40 last year, right? <laughs> okay. um, just, just want to get the record straight, you know. The, uh, it's, it's really great to, uh, I was just chatting with uh, Philip before uh, uh, you start, we started that, you know, as Philip mentioned that I was a Dean of a graduate school, uh, part of my joy and probably the most joy was travel around the world to meet with alumni. And uh, I visited the Paris, I think you have a Harvard local uh, club there. I met people there and we had the great food and wine, everything that, uh, these are the fun memories. So I was always really pleased to see alumni. That's great. And we have quite a few today uh, with us. Um, I'm based, uh, um, uh, uh, Charlie is mentioning uh, Paris. I'm, I'm based in Paris, uh, but uh, joining you and uh, I see that we have people from all over all over the world. So uh, just to just to give a, a just a, a brief um, introduction of how the office hours works, we have um, so we'll have a few questions that um, that I prepared just to kind of set the um, set the stage, but. Um, we've also received some uh, some questions in advance uh, from from some of you from the participants that I want to make sure that we're we address as well, and then um, obviously to leave a little bit of time if you have any questions, uh, we, please please enter them into the chat function and we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of the uh, towards the end of the conversation. So uh, so professor, I wanted to start off. Um, uh, some of the things that we discussed, which were so, so interesting on, on the podcast. Um, just tell us a little bit about data science. Why is it more, why is it, is just as important to uh, all of us as it is just to data scientists? Right. Well, thank you uh, for that question. I think uh, every one of you, uh, uh, part of the reason you joined this is I'm quite sure that data science now uh, touch everyone's life, just like, uh, 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 you know, anything else, because the, um, I, in university these days, we think about training students, having some basic idea about data science is about training them to have some writing skills. And uh, whether you are reading newspapers or you're, you're, you're thinking about, uh, you know, your career futures and anything you're doing in life these days are hard to escape the, the impact of the, you know, data science, both good, good and bad. I think of probably the most obvious one that uh, I was telling people, if there's any, um, if there's any silver lining about this COVID-19 is that it really uh, made all of us aware of the importance of assess uncertainty, right? Because uh, I think I'm quite sure every one of you that have has faced problems where because of COVID-19, even just planning for anything, right? These days, you know, yeah, but we, I got involved in quite a bit of uh, planning these uh, uh, conferences. The question is like, are we going to open up, open up next year? Are we going to meet in person? You know, shall we do a hybrid version? I mean, that's kind of just, uh, you know, in terms of grand scheme thing, that's not really a big deal. But it's, a, it's an example of uh, is how, how we uh, all need to really thinking about how to make a decision uh, you know, and the uncertainty. And then the, the other most important part is assessing, you know, risk. Uh, and, 
And the risk now is, is a real term now, as every one of us know that now even by going out, uh, it's not just a risk you know, to yourself, you could bring risk to others. So suddenly this notion of uh, probability, right? Uh, it's become something that you just have to grapple with almost in, in, in any decision, right? If, if people tell you, uh, you know, there's a 50% chance you go out today, you will get COVID. You probably won't go, right? Well, if you, if you say eh, it might be 1%, well, then it depends on who you are, right? And, uh, uh, and, and then maybe, you know, one out of a million, then it's a whole cares, you know, we have lots of things that one out of a million, I'm gonna go out. So you can see that, that uh, first is how do you think about these kind of individualized risk? That's actually really a, a very big question. But second is where these numbers come from, right? Or, you know, where these numbers come from. And, and I think the one thing I want to talk a little bit about it, about in terms of general understanding of data science is just to think about like, uh, you know, where do you get these numbers and, and how much you can trust these numbers? And I, and I'll tell you that as a professional statistician, I basically have a very skeptical way of viewing almost any of these numbers out there for two reasons. Uh, one is basically it's a, you know, it's a quality issue. The data quality is a really uh, incredibly important problem and uh, uh, lots of data out there, particularly for COVID-19, where there's a death rate, infection rate, all those things. You think a death rate will be easy to, to kind of estimate. It, it turned out to be really very complicated. For example, you know, people die for multiple reasons. And, uh, uh, you know, if they have COVID in it, that you, does it count as just only COVID or, or more broadly? And early on, people did not know there's a COVID existence. So a lot of deaths may be attributed. Now you're probably over attributing. And there, you know, there are lots of those things. And, and the risk itself has also become much more complicated because the number you have seen, uh, whatever the number gets reported, how many cases are out there, I mean, these are about a population. This is not about you. Now, each of us have to uh, think through how do you assess your own risk? Then you suddenly start to almost doing the concept called regression, right? Uh, many of us I know hate the uh, concept of you know, doing any statistical analysis regression, but you start to think about, okay, now you think about your age, you think about, do you have some pre-existing condition? You know, and uh, do are you living in an environment where where there are a lot more people who gets exposed? You just start having to consider all these kind of uh, uh, comp, you know complicated you know these factors. But every factor you add in is like doing a regression, and this actually technically you're fitting a could call the logistic regression, right? On the right side, on the left side is is this called a logic function of the probability you you get say you get uh, uh, a COVID. And the right side is many factors. And so you can start thinking about, you know, this is a, right there, I already give you an example why you need to start to understand a little bit of where those, uh, those numbers come from because they really, you know, really affect you. And I, I can go on with many, many examples. I'm, you know, I'm sure that many, many of you will have lots of examples. Some are easier to address, others are much harder, but uh, this is a really long answer to a simple question. <laughs> what is data science? But it's, it's data science is not, really just part of our life. It's just because we're living a, in, in a society, uh, uh, in, in an age, digital age, that uh, everything one way or the other coming to us in a kind of quanti you know, quantitative way. And uh, the very need of assessing a risk or uncertainty means that we, should, we will always need to deal with uh, uh, this probability concept. And itself is a very complicated one, has many different interpretations. And I'd love to talk more about that, but let me stop right there. No, that's excellent, and 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 a great uh, uh, a great way to uh, set the stage for uh, some of the the issues we're discussing here. One of the um, the things that I was struck by when we last spoke was, well, you know, we had a discussion about trust and privacy uh, in data, and one of the uh, the examples that you 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 brought up was how it relates to. How it relates to COVID, for example, for testing and tracing, and um, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges challenges there, uh, and uh, just your view of that balance uh, that uh, of, of what is? Uh, I think I think I think you you explained it as uh, if uh, if nobody wants to share, then then there is no uh, <laughs> there is no information to there is no data to an to analyze, uh, but uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I would definitely love to. And I, if you don't mind, I, in a minute I'm going to share a screening with you, the Harvard Data Science Review. You obviously Great. have to forgive me to uh, uh, give free advertisement. It's free itself, uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to show you some really serious uh, articles uh, written by philosophers talking about data science being being very broad, broad about how to thinking about AI, you know, tracing like in, in this COVID nineteen situation. But let me just say broadly about this issue of data privacy. And that's also an example I give why I think about data science as an ecosystem. It's not just uh, traditional thinking data science, it's about statistics, computer science, applied math, engineers. It's yes, these are all incredibly important contributing field of, to the data science. But when you think about this issue, this kind of a, uh, a privacy trade-off, it really becomes a much broader issue. It's a, it's an ethical issue. It's a societal issue. It's a political issue, and there are all these issues, right? Um, the let me say just at, at the fundamentally, I always tell people like, like humans are very good at creating problems for ourselves. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? Just think about the term data privacy. I said if you look at these two terms, data privacy, it's almost like oxymoron, right? Data are born to review, that's why you collect data. Data want to tell you something. Do you want to use data to, you know, as, as, as a way to get information, as a way to inform yourself? But privacy means we have to conceal, right? That's the things like you don't want to tell people. So the concept of data privacy right there, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like, you know, there's always a problem there. Now, what is the big problem here? Uh, this also relate to the big topic of AI, right? In order to do AI well, we need to collect lots of data particularly on the current personal data, right? You gotta in personalize anything, personalize medicine, personalize education, personalize med marketing, everything you wanna do. You wanna collect lots of data to see how, you know, uh, how this, uh, whatever you want, it's called outcome is related to lots of personal, uh, you know, uh, traits. The problem right there is we all love to have these all kinds of AIs to help me. But most of us also hate the idea that, you know, someone knows so much about me. Like often now they really know much more about me than myself. I don't keep track of everything I do, but I'm sure whatever I did online, everything that there's a record of, of somewhere. So people basically we have this fundamental problem, which is that we, 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 we love information and we say, oh, it's fine. You're collecting information from others. Just don't collect information from me, right? But the fundamental problem is other people's other people are me, are us. So there's just no way to, to, to get around it because as a group, we will forever have, you know, have this issue. COVID-19 is such a vivid e example, as you have heard, right? There are countries do much better uh, because they have a, such a strict trace, right? I have just some uh, friend returned to China and they've told me like how they go, the moment that they land, like they basically quarantine their people, escort them all the time, right? They're in the hotel, no contact, like uh, and then one of them have a special reason they had to go to home that uh, they will, before you open the door, you need to use the word called WeChat to, uh, to contact the police. The police will have a video uh, uh, seen with you that they will see how you open the door, pick up stuff, get the permission, then get in. They will see you do not contact anyone else and you'll be quarantined for 14 days. And any contact, anything mailed to you needs to be checked, right? And and uh, for my friend, they told me is that a couple of them. They told me like for them, there was like a nine people responsible for them, including local community, people from airport to the hotel, hotel gets home and they deliver food. Like they do that. Now, uh, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of uh, control the uh, you know quarantine, control the disease, terrific, right? I think we would all agree. But think about privacy, right? If you worry about privacy, forget it, right? Because you basically, you know, basically you have to give up all this privacy. Now, that worked in China. Would it work in US? I doubt it. I don't think it would happen here. Would it work in your country? It depends on who you are, where, where you are. So the reason I mentioned all those things is that uh, in the process itself, there's a lot of things are digital technology, right? The video, everything. And also this contact training, this whole process itself, helps government collect lots of data, right? There's, there's an incredible amount of data being collected. Now, as we know, when they collect all these data, they're incredibly useful, but in the wrong hands, it could be incredibly dangerous. And also it doesn't even have to be in the wrong hands. In the right hands, 
uh, if you're not careful, there's always this slip slope, uh, slip slopes, right? Things just get get out of hand. So this is the thing I was talking about is privacy, data privacy. I was telling, you know, I through the uh, Harvard Data Science Review and other venues, I published articles and talk about us. So we really have to think about, like, you know, where do you draw the boundary? Is not a question for statisticians, computer scientists, for this us create the technology. It, it's not a it's not a, a question for any single discipline, right? It's really a collective answer. It's a, it's it's a for you know for the whole society. So you can I mean you can see right there, right? You know things you know things are just you know things just gets gets much more complicated. Let me uh, let me show you this particular article because uh, it's a wonderful article uh, done by by uh, David Leslie from uh, from from Turing Institute. He's the uh, Essex team leader, uh, a philosopher. And uh, let me see where is, uh, okay. Done. So I'm gonna share the screen with you. And, uh, and again, these are entirely free. And so you can go online to, to find yourself. You even, you even have my permission to go now if you want to check. <laughs> um, so can you, can you see it? Can you see the screen? That, uh, yes. Sure. Okay. Yes. It's uh, it's sort of tackling COVID is through responsible AI innovation, five steps in the right direction. I tell you, this is the longest article we published. Uh, this article itself has uh, over sixteen thousand words. It has ten thousand words list of references. Uh, it's a really comprehensive article. It's a terrific one. It's a very philosophical, but. It, it basically this lay out all kinds of you know guiding principles, yeah, and uh, you know different countries, different group may may implement differently, but there are lots of uh, uh, real issues, and this is the type of thing that uh, um, uh, you know people think about why data science is is you know is so broad. This entire entire article, right? The only numbers you you see are years, right? There's not any, even any data in it, okay? But but it's a squarely a data science article because this shows how shall we responsibly using AI, right? So it's, a, it's just incredibly, so I, you know, I certainly encourage you to read it. It's a, it's a not easy read, it, you know, it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of re reflections, you know, consider context, anticipate impact, engage inclusively, act responsibly, you know, they're all those things. There are lots of things that are common sense, but you, you need to see how these scholars, you know, frame them. And uh, this is just, this is just a one example. Um, let me let me give you another example, which is more local to United States, but I think sooner or later may get to your part of the world as well. Um, as you know, that uh, uh, U.S. conducts the census, uh, the national census, every every ten years, you know, every decade. Twenty twenty is such a year, and uh, and uh, so they uh, they just made an announcement uh, not too long ago. Uh, you know, announced that. Uh, uh, this year, this 2020 census, that the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau is going to conduct in in, in such a way that uh, uh, it it will be that the answer uh, the the number they collected before they release, they will inject uh, noises before they release. Okay, this will be quite a revolution. Basically, saying all the data you will see, other than the national totals and and, and the state totals, basically, in some sense, then there are they are, they are not real numbers. They are always noise injected. Now, why would a, a, a country collect all these data as accurate as possible, then suddenly trying to in, inject the noise into it? Well, it's for, uh, you know, protect the privacy, right? And, uh, and then now the question is how much noise should you inject? How do you do it? Now, they're, they're part of the thing, which is really, uh, I'm, I'm trying to search for another article uh, right there, you will see a lot of a census article already because this is a discussion paper. Are we, I want to see there's a seven lessons. Seven lessons, differential privacy. Okay, let me, let me actually launch this one. Can you, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the, the specific technology I'm talking about, and this is, a, a, this is mostly come from a computer science and the statistician gets involved in to not analyze that. So there is a technical side, it's called a differential privacy, okay? If you haven't heard of this term, you should have tried to learn what this, this term is because this is going to be you know, all over the place. This already get to uh, Facebook, Google, these, these private company is, you know, is trying to use them. Let me see if there is this, this, this article. This article is written by two social scientists. 
and they are, have an outcry. They're saying, wait a minute, social science rely on census data and many of the data is for providing uh, you know, uh, policy, uh, you know, pro providing information for policy making for a lot of important things. If the data comes with lots of noises, you know, what kind of answer are we getting? Or, you know, how can we guarantee these answers are still you know, relevant? So for them, there is this need to try to say, well, can we protect the data as, as accurate as possible? At the same time, this is, I always say, there's no free lunch, right? This one you can actually prove mathematically. It's not hard to think about. Uh, you, you can never have 100% privacy and still have something useful. The way to get 100% privacy is don't disclose data at all, right? And you can't have 100% utility and still protect some, some privacy. No, there's mathematically you can show that's just not possible. I think it's also common sense, okay? So what that says is basically say, okay, can we, can we give up a little bit of privacy, right? People say, well, you know, we, we are willing to give a little bit of privacy like we all do. And many of us, uh, anytime you use an app, right? You use uh, uh, ways or use whatever app, uh, Google map that you are giving up a little bit of privacy. People say, oh, we're willing to give a little bit of privacy in order to exchange for, you know, for utility. The question is, how much do you want to give up, right? Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge question for Census Bureau because they can only do this once, okay? It's, they can't really do it like for what you want to use to do this, because they can only release that they, uh, you know, data, data once. Let me show you this particular concept called a differential privacy, because uh, let me give you like a one minute crash course on differential privacy. If, ah, here it is. Can you see this formula here? There's a little formula here with this e to the epsilon. Um, can you see on the screen? All right, mm -hmm. okay. So the idea here is a differential privacy. Think about database. Let's say this was the original, the Census Bureau, there's an internal database. The database prime is say, in the database, I change one person. Let's say that, let's say Philip is in the database. So I have two databases. One is I have the real Philip in it. The other is I made a fake Philip in it, okay? And I use these two databases, I will do a calculation. Uh, let's say we, I want average salary of the everybody. So one of them has fill up the real salary in it. And if, if fair to fill up ever give us the, his real salary, it's, it would be- in Oh it. dear, it would, it would mess up the equation, <laughs> I'm sure. Equation. Yeah. And yeah. the other one, we, we just you know, put some phony number there. Okay, let's say we do that. Now, the idea here is that, <clears throat> how do we protect uh, Philip's privacy? If by changing Philip's, if I put in, putting, put, you know, putting a fake, putting a fake number into this database, suddenly that changes a lot. That means the answers, the overall answer is very sensitive to Philip's answer. Let's say Philip is like a Bill, you know, Bill, uh, you know, Bill Gates, right? If a Bill Gates is in it or not, if he reports honestly, you know, the average is going to change dramatically. If you're putting if if you're putting something else there, right? So the idea is that, of course, we do all this statistically. So the whole concept of a differential privacy is is to say, the probability that this answer, this whatever the average equal to a particular outcome, compared to the probability of the same database with one person change, Philip in and out, uh, get, get the answer. These two probability, what you think about statistically. There, the ratio of them essentially is how much they change. The change is very small. It's controlled by e to the epsilon. E is that a strange number. Many mm -hmm. of you was probably forgot. It's two point seven one a. You know, it's a it's a fun mathematical number for reasons we use e. But epsilon here is something. If epsilon equals zero, that means the whole thing is one. That means what? That means that you know whether Philip in it or not, it doesn't make any difference. If that doesn't make a difference, it means what? I cannot really tell. At least by release this data set, looking at this particular looking at this particular outcome will not reveal much about the Philip. Okay, but if this answer changes a lot, that means the Philip's answer is actually quite sensitive. We there, there's information there. So this whole concept of differential privacy this is called differential privacy because it's a differentiating these two two databases with one person in or not. Or, or one 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 person versus another this kind of fake person, and now the whole game the census bureau need to play is to to choose this epsilon. This epsilon is called privacy loss budget. Okay, the terms of privacy loss budget. The idea is the larger the epsilon, the more loss of the privacy. Okay, 
if epsilon goes to infinity, there's no protection. Okay, epsilon goes to infinity means you can you can release anything you want, which is terrible. Epsilon equal to to if, you know epsilon equal to zero means the only reason the epsilon can do zero is basically saying I basically this 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 mechanism here is to inject noise. I inject so much noise that that nobody can learn anything. Right. So what the sensor bureau does is create this random mechanism uh, to the database. So after inject the noise, that whether the person in or not, or whether real person in fake person, whatever the outcome will be, the statistically you cannot tell the difference up to this control level. Okay. So you just had a crash course for uh, for differential privacy. I usually charge fifty thousand dollars, but I give you for free. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, that. The question then is that you know, if you're a private company, you say, oh, I want to control my epsilon, right? I can decide for whatever purpose. But if you're a census bureau doing that, now how do I, what would be the choice of the epsilon, right? And the epsilons turn out to be, and that's a lot of debate because, because the issue here is that if you choose epsilon too small, you're gonna hurt a lot on the data quality. If you choose epsilon too large, you're not protecting the, uh, you know, you know, the, the privacy. And the most tricky part, this gets a lot of people very nervous about, as you can tell, the smaller the group is, the smaller your community is, a minority group, the smaller it is, they're more affected by these, by these protections. Because it's much easier to identify smaller group than large one. So in order to pro protect a smaller group, you need to inject a lot more noises to it, right? If you have like a three people, like give you the answer, like only three people there, you know, you, you can guess just one, one third. That's pretty high probability already. You need to inject so much noise to it. But so the problem is that, but if you inject so much noise to it and they can only do it kind of uniformly, then you, you heard some other group. So, so whatever you choose that, it's often what happened is the, the small minority group is gonna disproportionately be you know, you know, affected. It could be positive factor, it could be negative factor, but there are all kinds of consequences. So you can see at this moment that we have, I'm happen to be on one of the advisory uh, uh, group that I'm learning, you know, there's all these, uh, uh, what do you call user groups and the stakeholder groups that they're all discussing, like trying to negotiate with each other, what, what, what should be epsilon should be, right? So you can see now, this is a, I'm using this as really a shiny example, just like COVID-19, why data science affects everyone. Okay, because the Census Bureau data, at least people living in the United States, there are a lot of things they use for making adjustments, direct impacts, you know, impacts everywhere in party's life. And a lot of uh, social scientists do these analysis there. So you can see right there, it's a, it, it definitely requires the kind of a technical side of this uh, data science. Computer scientists know how to generate this random noise. And the statisticians now are going to tell the social scientists, how do you analyze the data with noise already injected in? How do you now undo them when you do the analysis? So there are these all technical ones that you can see why we will always have a job. Uh, on the other hand, the question about what epsilon should be is not a question of computer science or the entire computer science field the statisticians or any group should be determining, determining that on their own. It's a really a big societal discussion. So that's just another kind of you know shiny example. And again, I you know uh, greatly encourage you to uh, to uh, you know to uh, to read this article. And uh, there's another article I want to show you. It shows like the Census Bureau itself. They wrote an article for Harvard Data, uh, you know Harvard Data Science Review about the lessons they already learned, like try to try to implement this uh, uh, where this thing. Oh, it just yeah, it's right there. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm obviously I'm very proud of uh, what we have been doing the how data science review. I want to also mention that we will be publishing a special issue on differential privacy for 2020 census. And in fact, that uh, uh, the Census Bureau will be publishing their actual algorithm uh, with us. So. We will wow. become a definite, uh, you know, source for that. And this is the wow. article they already wrote: "Implement Defense yeah. Privacy: Seven Lessons from 2020 United States." And I'm encouraging, especially if you are involved in any kind of a governmental, uh, 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 you know, activities that uh, remind your uh, government or countries that if they want to implement defense privacy, read these things because this is what uh, the lessons have already learned. And this is just only at the beginning. There are a lot more uh, lessons coming. So. Again, right. Thank you.
every answer is a really long one, but uh, you stop me anytime, okay? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's uh, it's very germane. And one of the things I did want to make sure that we we, we discussed was uh, was exactly what the data science review is. And I think one of the things that struck me uh, when I first came across it, which I found really fascinating, was that you uh, that you clearly uh, recognize in the review the importance of other disciplines um, and that is something that um, you have um, a variety of different perspectives on there uh, from economics so, social uh, to um, you even have um, so you even have a culinary conundrums as well uh, um, that can be um, uh, rectified by uh, by uh, data science um, and and I I, I I won't reveal that you uh, you can all visit HDSR and and find that recipe yourselves but um, but yeah, I think it's important. It's important to um, to talk a little bit about. Um, so, if you can explain a little bit about what, how you came up with the, the 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 idea for the data science review, and um, uh, I think people will enjoy the, the, to to hear that it's it's not just for the uh, for the data scientists uh, that we need input input from from lots of people. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. I really welcome this opportunity to tell you about it. Uh, the idea initially was simply because, you know, Harvard has a Harvard Data Science Initiative. They're looking for ideas where we can kind of, you know, not only help Harvard internally, but also you know, put Harvard on the map in terms of uh, a leadership in data science. And uh, I, uh, you know, I was inspired by... Uh, the Harvard Business Review, I'm sure many of you uh, know what that is, as well as the Harvard Law Review and you know, Harvard Business Review as a leading uh, magazine style uh, for the you know, general industry uh, business uh, sector. Harvard Law Review is a really a scholarly, very rigorous legal scholarly work. And so, but what I wanted to do at the time is say, okay, you know, I, I knew that what's missing uh, is this, uh, it's, it's, it's a forum to have it's all walks of data science broadly interpret, you know, interpret, coming together to have a, have a forum to exchange ideas or debate or discuss. About. But the other thing I saw that was quite clear is that since we're a university, let's don't forget, you know, uh, uh, data science education, and, and that's so that's why we integrated these, uh, you, you know, these. Uh, these uh, you know three components. So we basically let me just show you go. Let me go to the home homepage that uh, um, to show you how the layout because essentially is how we how we uh, do it. I hope you can see clearly that uh, uh, right so so uh, we we have a we have a slogan this is is, is on everything data science and data science for everyone currently we have this uh, you know COVID-19 special issues you can click on it and we actually just come so so I always writing a, a, a you know editor in chief editorial. So if I've written seven of them, you're more than welcome to read them because mostly I'll be giving kind of a broad introduction to every article, but also pick up a theme. I talk about what data science is. In this particular issue, we're talking about reproducibility, replicability, and reliability. That's another big issue in science in general. And uh, then we have four sections. There's the panorama. Panorama is where really the kind of what I call the overview, vision, and debates. And that's, we have published the most, uh, you know, most articles. And many of them are by a variety of different, uh, you know, sectors. And this one particularly, we team up with the uh, U.S. National Academy of Science, because they have this panel on this committee on reproducibility replicating science. So we basically talk about how data science itself can help to uh, make the science more reliable, which is, which is every thing we all care about. So that's the, that's a panorama, uh, you know, section. And, you uh, um, Actually, let me actually, okay, this is, I'm actually showing you, let me actually, because I'm showing the internal version, let me actually get out of it. So this way I can show you the, show you what you can see. Um, let me see. Yeah, okay. Can you see, still see it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the panorama usually have lots of articles. Currently it's, it's only have one thing because that steam is still coming. We do, we do, we do this rollout. And uh, then we have this uh, uh, conocopia. Conocopia is what we call impact, innovation, and the knowledge transfer. Essentially, is applications, how data science are being used. In this particular issue, as you may, uh, it may not surprise you that we, before the election, we did a special theme on, on election, on prediction, elect, prediction elections. So we have elections, we, 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 
their predictions. They're also like a learning lesson from 2016. There are even articles uh, uh, later on on uh, estimating how many how many uh, votes are lost uh, due to mailing. Now, this is a this is a kind of application is, is you know using data you know for. Uh, for, for any kind of area, and there are a lot of examples. Then we have a section on stepping stone. That's for learning, teaching, and communication. That's all about education. In this particular one, we have this article about how a data science is being taught in two-year college. Now, we're trying to be really very inclusive, very broad. Two -year, people don't, may or may not even know what two-year college is, at least in the United States, they're quite a bit. The two-year colleges, they're not, you know, the four-year, obviously not four-year. They're more kind of a, you know, they are, they're very large. They, they prepare students uh, moving beyond the high school, but, but not necessarily directly go to the college. So you, so you kind of, these are community college, a lot of these training, there are lots of people there. And, then, and these are, uh, tends to be people are, you know, have less resources. So, so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're more need to be done. So we always publish some articles on the, on the education part. Then we have like the deep end research article. In this particular case, we, we choose an article which is written about how do you estimate the lost mail. That turned out to be a fascinating article. It's not easy at all because there's no, I mean, how do you know if something is lost? You know, how, how do you estimate that? And then the lost here is very complicated. It's not just like lost by post office. They're lost, and it's not just physical loss. There are things that are being uh, uh, sent, they did not return. There are things that are being counted, uh, shouldn't be counted. There's all kinds of crazy things, which I, you know, as you know, some of you know that what's going on in the US, that this is, a, this is a, actually at this moment, you know, still quite irrelevant. And uh, so, so this, this is again, a, you know, a really very long article. So then we have these columns. Uh, we have a column called the Minding the Future, and uh, that's about a building pipeline. We have an article in this particular issue directly by Angela Chen is a high school student. She wrote about, from a high school student perspective, wrote about what is the, uh, what is the uh, um, you know, what's needed in the high school. And if you, if you are parents, if you, uh, you know, try to get your uh, 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 children, daughter, you know, to, to, uh, to, to really uh, re, uh, read about this uh, because that uh, uh, there's really lots of interesting stuff. Then we, you know, these are reporter from American State Association, what they are doing to science education. Uh, this, is a, this is the one that Philip was mentioning that, that it's a really fun uh, column called the Recreations Randomness. And for this particular one, it's actually, uh, it should be just coming very soon. This is about, uh, uh, it's a really fancy, like how do you trace data that different countries on the player you know, you know, on, you know, on the play, uh, plan, uh, uh, play field. And uh, but let me go to that, that I can kind of review to you that uh, this column, we basically trying to publish things uh, directly, you know, kind of, it's, it's called a data science for leisure activity. We have published things about, can machine learning predict the price of auction, art auction? It's a fascinating article. Predicting auction is hard. You know, this, you read this article, you probably have heard this famous artist, you know, uh, duct tape some banana on the wall that sold for hundred fifty thousand dollars. How would you how would you anticipate that? Like you know, which banana cost like hundred fifty thousand dollars? You know, and uh, we have a prediction Oscar. And this was the this was the article. This is a recipe for success. And uh, uh, I would just certainly certainly encourage you to to read. And uh, uh, there are more coming. There are, actually there's a we're going to have a computational humor. You may you may be surprised by how people are using uh, the machine learning algorithm to generate uh, uh, jokes that are, uh, you know, by learning from other jokes. And, you know, that's a, that's lots of interesting stuff. And then particularly yeah. if you have kids, you want to motivate them, you know, that's, you know, that's, a, that's really quick. Uh, so, but yeah. that, that's just a, that's a, just a variety of stuff there. I'm, uh, and again, I should probably should have stopped because I'm talking too much, but, but it's, I just want to say that this is really, we, we really meant, mean that data science for everyone. So I hope you will always find, every issue find at least one or two articles you find is readable, you learn something, and who knows, you might even inspire to uh, to write for data, how data science is used. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So we have about 20 minutes left. I wanted to take about 10 minutes to address some of the questions really uh, briefly that, um, that were pre-submitted, and then we will have, we have a couple of more that are coming in. So. So uh, let me just choose a few from uh, from what was submitted. Uh, we have one of uh, one of our listeners uh, wanted to know: Can you provide some advice or examples on how high schools can build 
uh, necessary, uh, build these necessary for college and career? Yeah, well, actually, the perfect question because the high school students uh, article is is really a very relevant one, and uh, um, so I think the the uh, if you're, I mean, there are two questions, two aspects. If uh, one is like a, what a high school should done itself to help to training training the student, the other is is, is in terms of student them, uh, you know themselves, how would they how would they prepare for the uh, you know for the uh, for the uh, data science, uh, this kind of general career. I think, of, you know, again, I, because since there are so many articles online that you can, I mean, you can, you can definitely read. And, but I just want to mention that one thing is important uh, is to uh, uh, remind whoever is interested in getting to data science. The traditional way of thinking about data science is like, oh, I, I have to be very good at, at, at the mathematics. If I'm not good at mathematics, I'm not going to go into data science. I think that that's just a misperception. There's so many different entry ways in, in getting into data science. As I already showed you, these uh, these uh, uh, these philosophers write, you know, uh, uh, these articles which square in in the in the data as you know ethic issues, and they themselves, you know, some of them have good mathematics, others probably don't really have have you know have you know have, have too much, and so that's entirely okay. It's all that it's all that. Uh, I would say, you know, identify what areas, what areas you are, I mean, you are interested in. Are you interested in this more, more kind of a, a, a technical area, analytical area, or are you more interested in the kind of societal impact? There's a, there's a broad implementation and like this kind of a, you know, trade-off and depends on, on, on what you think. There's really a variety of ways of, you know, you know, of getting getting to data science. But having said so, I do strongly suggest everyone, uh, again, this is biased, but I hope it's not too biased. You definitely take some basic statistics courses. Okay, you basically, you, it's, it's like a learning language. You need to learn. You need to learn the language of probability. Okay, without the language, you'll be forever handicapped. It's just very much like, you know, no matter how much business you want to do in the country, if you don't know the language, always have somebody translate for you. You can still be very successful, but it's just a little bit harder. So learn the basic. Uh, so no matter who you are, don't, I don't care whether you ever want to be anything related to data science, learn some statistics. That become a language now just to communicate. It's uncertainty. Learn the basic idea. What is the probability? What is p-value? Do you read the thing, you know, all the time? You know, uh, uh, and uh, um, you know. So, so, what is the what is the kind of a statistical thinking? What is called a estimation? What is the notion of hypothesis testing? There are all these things, like just very basic notion. And uh, the good thing is, there are increasingly a lot more courses being offered uh, online and other, you know other places. And again, frankly, the Harvard Data Science Review itself is a incredible resource for for education. I'm actually really we are thinking about creating education products using these articles. That uh, to you know for training purpose, and since it's entirely free, feel absolutely free that you if you find these articles useful, you know use them to uh, you know to uh, you know to create uh, you know uh, uh, create create uh, educational content, and uh, um, so that's uh, that's kind of a, my broad answer. Great, great. We have another question actually, uh, and uh, the listener says uh, data science must must be interdisciplinary with both eth ethics and the applied area. Which application areas are you currently most involved in? Okay. Uh, I am, I'm currently involved in really, this is why I don't have time to sleep. This is one problem <laughs> with, with us at this moment, literally. Okay. I, I tell you that I'm currently uh, involved in three big projects. One I already mentioned, which is differential privacy. I just published an article with a former student of mine. We have another article coming. And uh, my involvement here is, is really to add a statistician to help how to analyze these noise injected data properly. You can't just analyze it as if there's no noise in it. You will get a really terrible answer. Okay, so that's one big area. The second area I'm, I'm involved in, which I talk a little bit about during my uh, podcast, Philip, with you, is the notion of uh, personalized medicine personalized treatment. How do you collect the statistical information when something is personalized? Personalized means what? If you're really thinking about personalized, it means that there's only one person you can collect a form, correct? Collect data from, which is you. Like, well, but it, before I give you treatment, how do I collect data from you? Like, so what are we talking about? 
how do we think about statistical evidence in this world when we try to be so individualized? And it, it boils down to the a, a philosophical question. What is individuality? And in the medical world, the individuality is not even your biological entity because your parents, your family history all matters into your health. So when you define individuals, you can't even define the individual just by you as a biological entity. You still just including everything else to your surroundings. So it, that turned out to be a fascinating uh, statistical problem that because the traditional statistics is collecting data from a sample to infer about a population. This turned the thing upside down. Is it collecting a bunch of people looks like you or smells like you or something like you and then trying to infer what would happen to you. So you see how much fun I'm having. So that, that is, that's another area. That, so that's a personalized medicine. And the third area, which is uh, I, saw, I alluded to, is I'm working on this notion. I'm trying to create, I wrote a paper in 2018. And I think I'm probably the first one to explicitly uh, quantify, propose this concept of quantify the quality of the data. I created a data quality index. Everybody know how to quantify data by quantity. I say, oh, this company has lots of data. Well, lots of data doesn't mean much. In fact, if the lots of data are low quality, it's terrible because they, they confirm the wrong answer. So if you want to buy some data, you want to know what's their quality, just like you buy product. You're not just going to say, I want to buy, just tell me how many pieces there. You want the quality. But how do you quantify the quality? It's much, much harder than quantify the, the quantity, obviously. And the other reason really hard is the quality depends on the purpose of why you use the data. Uh, you know, the, 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 it, it, the same data set could be incredibly useful for one study, it could be useless, could be even harmful for another study. So that makes the whole notion of uh, quality index is much more nuanced. So that's three kind of big area. I also work on lots of other uh, computations, simulations, some mathematics, but these are the three big areas. I'm very excited because each one of them are all here because of this poach uh, big data. But also, uh, it's also really, really hard because the yeah, see everyone has has some really hard piece in, in in it. But that's 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 what it kept me busy. Professor, it seems like you you have a lot of leisure time, like a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, All right. That's, that's why I drink wine, right? Right. Exactly. Right. So I'll take. I'm going to just ask one more question from uh, from the pre-submitted questions, and then we'll move over to the uh, the questions from the audience. Sure. Um, and, and this is actually a, a good segue from from your from your last uh, uh, last uh, question. Uh, do you see data science at some point in the not so distant future eliminating human decision making, or will, will it will it only be to augment it? And why do you think so? Right. You know, as a statistician, I never give any answer with 100% certainty, but this one, I'm going to violate my professional training. I'm going to say it will never eliminate human decision. Yeah. I, I just want to make the clear and loud, it will never be a decision. Why? Humans are very good at creating problems for ourselves. You know, whatever problem we solved, we will have new problems. We will need to, the humans are just, uh, you know, like just this whole defined your privacy. I just never, I, I just don't see it will ever being automated. That, you know, how do you, what is the right choice here? Because it's just so nuanced. And mm -hmm. you know how humans, every group, you know, we, we, every group we have for wrong reason, for right reasons, we all are trying to, you know, keep uh, competing for survivorship, for power, for whatever it is. So you will see this whole, you know, whenever there are human, there will be politics, so there are politics, there will be decisions need to be made. There are all sorts of things. So I just don't see uh, um, we, will, we will ever uh, um, sort of replace human decision. In fact, that what's interesting is that the, the use of AI itself creates more decision need to be made made by you know by human right exactly like the ai tracing like it could be yeah it could be incredibly powerful but do we want to use it well that's a question for for humans to to decide so yes it will augment it for sure it will augment it more it will create more problems and uh, uh, it will be i think it'll be forever this is what i use the term data science is ecosystem it will be a forever like ecosystem like evolving and uh, uh, so uh, never think that you will have easy time. Just sit home, you know, uh, decide, uh, you know, uh, 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 let uh, let AI decide. The other thing I would say, I probably never want any machine to decide what kind of wine I should have. So uh, that would be always my personal decision. So, 
Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, so we have um, actually uh, uh, one question here uh, from the audience from, from John Ellis. Uh, John says, I'm a graduate of the college. Do you foresee data science requirements for undergrads? Uh, greetings from Hyde Park, University of Chicago, Fritz Grimmel. Thank you, and uh, I have a fond memory of Hyde Park that I I, I still have an affiliate appointment at University of Chicago, go, go there quite often. Uh, excellent question. I want to tell you, I, uh, I, this itself, itself can be an hour talk about what Harvard was trying to do. I will be brief. Uh, uh, we, yes, we try to uh, implement a data science uh, requirement uh, for every student coming to Harvard. And uh, uh, believe it or not, this gets a little bit, a bit complicated because, you know, for most of the probably say, well, if we're going to require one course, sure, it should be a course on data science. But then you have, uh, you, we have, you know, like every other group, you have different voices. And uh, we end up of, uh, calling something called uh, uh, empirical uh, quantitative reasoning with empirical data. You are yeah, something, you are a, you know, something yeah. very, very awkward. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I, 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 I'm not blaming any of my colleagues, but uh, uh, you know, uh, mathematical department thinks calculus is very important. Well, calculus is very important, and uh, calculus without calculus, a lot of science would not be advanced. The question is, does every student need to know calculus, right? And uh, so, in the end, because you know, there's all kinds of other reasons that we end up of having a general requirement, essentially saying you need to do you need to take some courses and, but not necessarily just the one sort of data science course. But I think, uh, uh, I think that this is inevitable. I think that we go through this period that at some point, uh, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm uh, not hundred percent sure on this one, I'm probably 95% sure that uh, uh, university will have, will have this kind of requirement, just like requirement about the writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody if had, going to have college, you know, there's export writings, you, every, you have to go through that. There may be different versions of what different styles, but you should just take one on. Because uh, I think that the basic knowledge about data science is really become, uh, as I said, is, is a basic language training. So, uh, so I think it, it will happen. We're not there yet, but we do have this one general education requirement on called Imbrico and uh, whatever, I forgot the quantity of Imbrico uh, reasoning. And uh, uh, which is, you know, I'm, I'm involved. That's the other part of I'm not sleeping. I'm involved in creating a new data science course called uh, uh, Data Science 10, DS10, jointly with the uh, uh, economic, uh, sorry, with the uh, computer science department. And we taught last year once and we're gonna do it again in, in the spring. It's not much fun to teach it online, but that's, that's the way, uh, that's the way it is. So. All right, thank you. So, um, okay, so we have uh, two more questions. We have about uh, seven minutes left, so we'll we'll just uh, try to keep these as uh, quick as possible. Uh, uh, Stuart uh, uh, says to us, "I'm a big fan of the work being done by Harvard Sports Analytics Lab, led by Mark Blickman, uh, which Professor Meng just mentioned. Um, uh, could you ask Professor Meng to talk talk a little bit more about Sports Analytics Lab?" Great. Well, in fact, uh, thank you for uh, for the question. That uh, Mark Glickman is the uh, you know at a column editor for this uh, for for this uh, uh, randomness uh, requesting randomness. Initially, I invite uh, Mark just to uh, create a column on you know sports uh, analytics because there are so much so much there. But uh, Mark told me no 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 he wants to do more. So now we do do a lot more. So what what we have is in the department we have this. Uh, uh, this uh, called sport, uh, you know, sports uh, analytics lab, and Mark is a director, and he hosts uh, a weekly seminar. And uh, uh, if any of you are interested in, you can shoot me an email. I'm quite sure I can uh, send uh, your request to uh, to Mark that to add you on whenever they have the Zoom. This, this is thanks to Zoom. You can actually join the Zoom one that if you want, to, you want. To. I think it's weekly or maybe sometime maybe bi-weekly. And he has multiple students working with him. I'm, I'm this year, I'm also the co-director of uh, graduate studies. So I talk to every student and uh, I learned some of them, you know, they're doing lots of these rankings. Uh, that's, you know, Mark's, uh, as if anyone know Mark, that he initially get into, because he's also a, a, a master of chess. He was the one designed this kind of a, uh, U.S. you know uh, chess rating scheme, the, at least the new version, and so he does a lot of work about this kind of sports ranking rating, 
and uh, and from there that uh, uh, previously we had a colleague. Unfortunately, he left us. Uh, he he actually now hired by I I forgot it was a uh, was a baseball team or something because he did it so well uh, or basketball team that he's in Canada now. Um, that he does all these. This is a very much this uh, this article I just show this record uh, recreated games is doing that kind of a uh, uh, analysis uh, tracking. Uh, tracing the player's movement, you know, on the basketball court, what movement are the most, uh, uh, you know, effective in terms of shooting, in terms of defensing, defensing, you know, you see, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is the hardest kind of data, other than all the defensive privacy issues, is that kind of a spatial temporal data. It has a time component, it has a spatial component, right? Because obviously it's a, and it's so, and it's enormous amount of data. So uh, actually once this article, this article should be out probably just, if it's not this week, next week, you will see there, there's all these animations that mimicking how the players like moving on the basketball court. And uh, so, yeah, it's a very active area and uh, we got lots of students interesting. And uh, previously was led by uh, my other colleague who retired, Carl Mars. And uh, there's also undergraduate student group. But if you have interest in any more details, uh, feel free to reach out to Mark or reach out to me and I can, can I introduce you. Fantastic. So we have, uh, we have just a few minutes left. So um, keep this one to about two minutes. Um, uh, John Stemmel mentioned, uh, he, he asks, you mentioned predictions for the election. Why did data scientists get the election so wrong with predictions of a national blue wave? Yes. Uh, in, two well, <laughs> in, in two minutes. Well, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you that. That I'm going to give you a, a three-second answer, which is the data quality. And uh, sure. but I also want to show you that particular article was actually uh, uh, in this issue. Really talk about uh, you know talk about this uh, uh, this issue. Uh, I mean, the, the the fundamental problem is here. The whole idea of uh, pools. I just I'm actually having an article coming out of in American. Uh, Scientific American they asked me to write article. I wrote that my article, 2018 article on this, uh, on this, uh, um, on my 2018 article on this data quality, I applied to this 2016, you know, 2016, 2016 uh, election. And basically what I, what I show there is the problem is that uh, the whole idea of the pool being reliable is that being representative. The property sampling is to ensure everybody has equal chance, you know, at least roughly speaking. But the problem is that when people refuse to give you an answer, they have, there's a, there's a self, self selection bias, right? Because when you, you know when people when you know when people refuse to give you an answer, particularly if they look at the answer and say, no, I don't want people to know I'm voting for for this particular candidate. If they hide the answer from you, they refuse to answer. Then your your pool is no longer. It's you know it's no longer a, a, a representative, and that can cause enormous bias. And, and and what I'm what I'm trying to show, I don't know if you can see. Can you still see my screen? Have I changed? Yes. Okay. So this is the article. If you can see this article, it's on my uh, website. You, if you want to read it, this is where I propose the concept of the uh, data science uh, data quality index, and I show in this particular article. It's even an abstract. In the in the 2016, and it, apparently it's happened again in 2020 because people don't le learn the lesson. There is this kind of a correlation. It's a five percent, half part, half percent of correlation between you decide to vote for Trump and you respond to the survey. It it was this kind of a only like half percent of correlation, but the half percent correlation caused enormous damage. I did a calculation, basically show it's it's in the abstract. If you have answer from 20, 2.3 million people. With that half percent correlation, their statistically, its error is equivalent to you have a genuine good pool with 400 people. You have a 99.9 percent reduction on the data, and that's why you're seeing this enormously terrible, you know, answers just because this. And it's a fundamental harder problem. If people refuse to give an answer for reasons they don't want to give to you, you will always have the problem. And uh, it's uh, unless you know how to correct them, it's it's a terrible problem, and we see. Now again, twice. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Professor. Really, it's always it's always such a joy to uh, to speak with you. You really are a true visionary and uh, and bring so so much perspective to uh, to a topic that everyone thinks is is just purely scientific uh, when it's uh, far broader than that. So, right. thank you once again for uh, for joining us, and thank I thank everyone also in the audience. Um, I hope this was helpful and. Um, 
and uh, and uh, we wish you a good uh, rest of your day. I want to say thank you all for you know for attending this, and I hope I didn't waste it with your time. If you feel like I waste your time, I will listen to you for talking for an hour. Okay, <laughs> and uh, and again that uh, uh, check out the Harvard Data Science Review for every we publish every quarter. We constantly have articles. Already have more than hundred articles are free. Help to get the words out. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much.